Okay, so in this, uh, this hour, we try to understand the key points about the objects and functions. First, uh, objects which are, objects and functions are the two, two cornerstones of uh, JavaScript programming, okay? Apart from, okay, the primitive types that we have uh, played with in the previous hour, uh, these are the real you know, elements that uh, are used in all uh, the, um, <laughs> in every program, and they behave quite differently from other uh, programming languages, okay? Uh, objects. Uh, first of all, uh, if you know anything about uh, object-oriented programming from uh, languages like Java, forget it. Because uh, the object model in JavaScript uh, is uh, totally different. Uh, what they say actually is that uh, uh, JavaScript is really an object-oriented language. And uh, for example, Java would be more properly called a class-oriented language. Because everything, every behavior is defined at the class level. Object instances are just you know, slaves or their own defining class. In JavaScript, uh, basically, there are no classes. There are only objects. Well, they're not really true. They introduce classes uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the later versions, so we can use also the class syntax. Uh, but when we learn it, uh, uh, the class syntax would be just a, a syntactic uh, sugar around functions. So basically, the two key elements here are objects and functions, and everything is built around them. Then we'll have syntactic sugar for talking about classes and properties, but uh, they are not really behaving the way we are accustomed to. Uh, objects are the primary data type in, uh, in JavaScript, and an object may exist without a class. There is a predefined, uh, say, class, if you want, uh, predefined we don't talk about classes. A predefined type called object from which uh, every object is created. And the objects are not bound uh, <coughs> to have the same structure or their defining class, which doesn't exist as a concept. Objects are totally dynamic in their property. So a single type object can be the, the mother of all instance objects with any kind of combination of properties. Because properties in an object are, in JavaScript, are dynamic. You can add, remove, modify properties, not just values, also the, the list of properties at any time at one time, okay? There is no constraining the, the, the list of properties of an object, uh, be there value properties or function properties. Function properties are what other languages would call methods, okay? There is no notion of methods here, even. There's just notion of properties. And some of these properties can be functions. So we need to re rework a bit our mental model. Uh, my suggestion is uh, don't fight it, okay? Don't try to obtain in JavaScript what we were accustomed, what the same programming habits or patterns that you were accustomed in other languages, because you will get hurt. Um, so objects are First class citizens in the language, they are totally dynamic. Uh, you can add or delete or redefine any property or any method at any time directly on the object instances. So you may have three instances, each, each of them of the same, you know, coming from the same source, and each of them can later on have different properties from the other. There is no notion of uh, private and protected or stuff like that. So everything is public. We may have some conventions saying, that, okay, if something starts with an underscore, don't use it, but it's just a programming convention. The language doesn't enforce any uh, access control on object properties. And there's no real difference between properties and methods, and we'll understand that when we see the functions, because functions are variables, uh, sorry, are values. And so uh, a property may have a value of type function. If you like it, we can call it a method of the object if you want. Okay, so by after clearing our minds, 
from what is not true in, in JavaScript, what is an object? Well, it's simply a collection of names and values. So you can call it a map, you can call it a Nash table. You can call it a dictionary. Something that maps names to values. Let's call it an object, and it's a primitive data type. Uh, you can use it uh, also as a dictionary, maybe if you want. You can use it as a map, as a map data structure. There's also the map object in the like standard library, which is more full feature, but for simple things. Uh, and what, what does a mapping data structure do? Uh, it can it it'll help you define some keys. And each key may point uh, to a value. And again, we already learned that uh, uh, the value may have different types, uh, and, uh, uh, and they are uh, also there are totally dynamic. Okay. Uh, the limitation is that uh, compared to a, a general map data structure, is that the keys are strings, must be strings. Okay. The keys the maps uh, strings. Uh, to values, a set of strings to values. How to define them? Uh, well, we may define an object with the uh, races, and inside the races we have a list uh, of uh, properties. In the syntax, uh, property name, colon, property value, just for initializing. So a literal object uh, is described like that. And for accessing the elements, uh, X is the name of a first property, Y is the name of the second property. We can access them like point.x and point.y. Okay. Quite normally. Yeah. The syntax is quite normal. Um, the, normally, the name of the property is a string, so the name of the key, the key value no? is a string but uh, it normally doesn't require the quotes around it uh, it's not nice it's easy to write it's easier to write uh, uh, but it's basically an historical uh, feature and uh, it creates some problems with the, with complex name or with names that are also keywords in the language but uh, we'll see in general the, the syntax of an object will be mapping names to values, and these names will be just listed there as they were identifiers or quoted. Of course, if your name, if your key name contains, uh, you know, spaces or punctuation or reserved words, uh, you must quote them. Otherwise, JavaScript will pretend that uh, they are quoted and use them anyway. Okay, uh, it's a shortened syntax. Uh, in other contexts, like for example, in Python dictionaries, you will need the quote in any time. In JSON format, uh, you need the quote any time. Just in JavaScript, uh, there's this uh, si simple ways of declaring them. Hmm? Property names, names and values. So I'm mapping names and values. What can names be? Names are strings. Uh, they must be unique. It's a, it's a map, it's a hash table, after all. Uh, so you cannot have du duplicate, uh, uh, duplicate uh, uh, names, duplicate keys in the same object. You can create a key when you initialize the object in the literal brace, or after that, just by assigning them. Hmm? And you can delete also property, uh, a property from an object after it has been created. Hmm? There's an operator called delete delete point dot y, it will delete it hmm? from this. And uh, values are normal any JavaScript values uh, of any type. So any property of an object may ref refer to any value and can be, of course, updated during the life cycle of an object. Hmm? Uh, these values can be arrays, can be other objects, can be functions, can be anything. Okay. Uh, 
the only thing that is wrong on this slide is this word here inside. Mm. Uh, the values are not, in, I need to correct the slide. Um, the values are not inside the object, are outside the object ref with a reference. Uh, this is the reference to the, to the value which is inside the object. Okay, let's keep always the mental model that we have an object and then the value that contains, like in this picture. The object, con uh, no, it's not, uh, it's not drawn like, in, like, uh, like it. Sorry, yeah. I, I will make another picture. Okay, um, let's make it some, some example just to, to see how it works. Okay, let's create an object uh, file. Okay, so we may just create an object uh, like like uh, we said. Uh, okay, first we have uh, let, let's continue on the example that we had before. A person that has some score. Okay, so we have a person. Uh, my scores or my profile, let's say. My profile, uh, I have some, a name. I have some initials and ac acronym. That is maybe computed by the, uh, by the call before. I may have some uh, scores that I may be modified, improved. Uh, In my uh, in my description, and can be an average score of uh, whatever I don't know. Let's me let's make it three. Hmm? What's wrong? Ah, I'm missing a comma. Sorry, commas from between each element and the column instead of an equal. Sorry. Okay, so I initialize an object like this just by creating something between braces and, and defining a, a set of uh, property names of keys and a set of uh, values. Can be strings, can be numbers, can be arrays in this case, or whatever. Hmm? And, okay. Log uh, my profile. It's... Uh, Okay, it prints it in this way, in this case. Hmm? And uh, um, I can access the elements. For example, I can print the scores, uh, dot scores. In this case, dot scores is uh, a reference uh, to the value of the element whose key is called scores. And in this case, it's an array, and so I'm printing the array of these values. Okay, so object name dot property name gives a reference to the, up to the, to the actual value, both for reading and for modifying. So if I want, I can change the my profile dot average score. I can make it seven, six, I don't know. And if I print the object again, I expect to find the new value. Yeah. Okay, so once an object is defined, I can always use or refer to the values of its own properties, and I can use always modify the value associated with each property. By reassigning a new value, or by, uh, yeah. And the new value could be of the same type, it was a number, it's still a number, or could be a different type. You don't care. Hmm? I can also add new properties at runtime. So my profile, now you want to add, uh, I don't know, the, the country. and just 
set a new string value and I call it country. And this is a, an attribute that is will be silently or normally added to the current ones. So like if you think it as a as a mapper, you're just adding a new entry into the map. Mapping the country to a string. So that's what I mean where I say that the, the, the objects uh, are dynamic. I can add, modify the values, of course, of, uh, of, uh, of the property, but I can also modify the list of, uh, of keys, so the list of entries, dynamically. Um, okay. Right now, I only use the simple names as properties, name, acronym, country, and so on, called property names, so I didn't need to quote them. Uh, if by, for example, if, I, if I, I could define a key, like you have here, chapter pages, uh, that contains spaces or contains other special characters, then I will be forced uh, to, uh, to use uh, quotes around that for defining the property. But if I have a, a property with, with spaces, for example, okay, for defining it, we just quote it. But what can we do for accessing it? Uh, for accessing the, the strange property names, uh, or also normal property names, we use braces. So book, instead of book dot chapter pages that would be impossible to parse because it is dot that we don't know where it, where it ends, we just put uh, the string value of the property inside the square bracket. So like we are indexing an array, but we are actually indexing a map with the string index uh, that we could access. So this is also possible for normal property names. So what I did before of printing uh, I don't know, um, my profile of scores, uh, it could have a total equivalent uh, if I write it like uh, access the element with my profile, brackets, uh, quotes, uh, scores. There are two equivalent syntaxes. The second one is more general the one in line 12, it will always work. The one in line 11 only works, of course, if the name is a, a number of properties, uh, is a valid identifier according to the language, okay? The second syntax, the one with the square brackets, uh, uh, also suggests us that uh, the name of the property could be dynamic. In this line, 11, scores is part of the, of the source code, okay? When I write the program, I'm fixing the name of the property that I'm accessing right now. But with square brackets, the, the content of the square brackets, which is the property name, can be an expression of type string. And so this expression can also be dynamic, computed by something else. And then we can also add or remove properties of who the, where the names of the properties are defined at runtime. Okay. Don't abuse that, but it's there for you. Especially if we are building, you know, generic functions that we need, they need to do same operation with different properties, we can use that by generating dynamically the property name. This is a more like, you know, a map or dictionary access looks like more dictionary access. The first one looks like more uh, object property access. You can look at them from different ways depending on what you are trying to do. The data structure supports both way of reasoning. Um, okay. Okay, uh, okay, the only limitation if, there's, if the, okay, the property name is not a valid identifier, you must use the, the brackets. Uh, um, yeah, okay, we can skip this. This just says that uh, 
uh, it syntactically looks like an array, but the index is a string instead of being an, an, a number. But it's the concept of uh, um, of map and or dictionary. Uh, I mentioned before that we can also we can easily add a new property with with both syntaxes. Okay, even this one with square bracket can be used to add a new property. They're totally equivalent. For deleting properties, there's a delete operator. Which is not a function, it's not a method, it's just a statement. Delete and then the name of the property. And this and this property will be dropped from the object. We don't use it very much. If we want to delete a property, you usually tend to create a new object without that property. Just because modifying something is dangerous. Um, okay, this is just an example. Just look at this line here. If I want to create uh, an object with many properties, I can compute the name of the property uh, just by creating a string in the format that we want and then using that. Maybe it's not uh, the best way to work. In, in this example, I would use an array probably, but the mechanism is there. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, consider these two different uh, syntax. Let's let's try to convert them in our in our example. So I write my profile. Uh, let's use a country. So I can write my profile dot country. I can write my profile square bracket quotes country. I can have a string equal to country, and so I can write my profile S. I cannot, or it's not, it's not the same if I write country without the quotes. Because in this case, okay, in the, in the first three cases, I'm always referring to the same property. So it can use this value or assign it a new value, modify it. The fourth one doesn't work because it would look for a variable called country and extract the string value from that variable. So it will not be C O U N T R or whatever. It will be if I if I have a variable called country, but like in this one. Okay. 22 and 23 are the same syntactically. And S contains the name of the property. Country, I don't know what contains, uh, maybe nothing, maybe it's an error or whatever. Okay, so just beware uh, of this is not working as you could expect. But this one is useful uh, for dynamically using the property of, the, of an object. Um, and since properties are dynamic, it's always a risk of accessing a property of an object. Because maybe I want to print here uh, console.log uh, console the country, my profile, the country. Just uh, the problem is that in line 16, the property country doesn't exist yet in the object because I only added it in uh, line 19. So what happens is that uh, JavaScript very silently creates an error. Country is not defined. Um, and so we should, uh, oh, as a property of an object, before, unless we are sure okay, of the property that are currently defined, uh, we should always check whether a property is defined or not. Uh, so for example, we can first check if, uh, uh, I don't remember if it is correct, let me try. My profile dot country, then print. No, it's bad. Is, uh, so the difference is country, this slide is wrong. Yeah. 
where is it here i want to see here where is the value okay the proper way of uh, checking is to check whether a property is uh, included in some object so we have an in operator which is a boolean operator gives a boolean value takes a property name and uh, an object reference and will tell us whether that property is in the object or not. Okay, and so in this case, I would say if country is in my profile, then I can else uh, maybe it will be an unknown country oh sorry uh, ah delete the last three minutes the error was here okay because this line was not uh, in the place okay so this is okay it's printing unknown country so this is the would be the correct way no, of checking i'm not sure whether uh no i uh, know this already has some property so i can check with the in operator whether it's contained or not and then i can use it but there is also a shortcut that was trying to do before and then I got confused by the error message that had nothing to do. There's a shortcut for undefined properties. So actually, if I try to use my profile dot country, a property which is not defined on the object, I don't get an exception. Okay, so the exception before I have nothing to do with this. I get an undefined value. Okay? So it will not crash the problem. Of course, if I try to do something more, maybe access the first element of something which is not defined, then I will get some error because uh, I'm trying to do some operation or call some methods or an object of type undefined, and undefined doesn't have any operation any methods defined for it okay but accessing a non-existent uh, attribute is a valid operation and gives you a valid result which is undefined and so you can use it to have a shorter my profile dot, dot country shorter test than console.log step We are exploiting the fact that undefined is a false value. And so, if it's false, the if is not executed, and if it's anything else than false, it's true, and so we are using this value. Um, with some caution because also zero and also the empty string are false so if by chance the country this should be a string so it should not be zero the number zero but if uh, an attribute is zero i cannot distinguish the attribute uh, whether it's present or not with this trick because both zero and undefined uh, will be considered false. So we'll treat it in the same way. So to be really sure, I should use the in operator that does its job. Checks whether a property is present. The shortcut is check whether a property is uh, undefined or falsy, or a zero or empty string, uh, then it works. So if I'm sure that zero or empty string never happen in my code, or if I'm 
I'm okay with treating them as a missing. So uh, the program will behave like the value was missing. And instead it was zero or it was the empty string, uh, then it's a, it's a normal shortcut to use. Um, there's also another way of, of doing that uh, with the Boolean operators. Uh, like like we saw before, usually an an if of that time of that type uh, is often written like uh, my profile dot country. So we need to do something that uh, if it's false, uh, don't do anything. If it's true, do something. So we can just put an end operator. If the value is false. Uh, the end is already false, so we don't need to execute what's on the right, or to evaluate what's on the right. If the value is true, we execute uh, what's, on, what's on the right, and in this case, it'll be this I don't know, console log. That will not be executed, of course. Okay, this is false. My profile of country is false. The end operator already has a, uh, the false element as the first element and so it doesn't care it doesn't care to evaluate the rest just return false well actually it returns undefined because the value of the first element but the value returned by the expression is just ignored i'm not storing or using the value anywhere i'm just using the shortcut expression for as a guard we are guarding the access with a set of uh, conditions, set of if, a set of doors that must be open in order to access to it. Hmm. And this is also true, we had that in the slides, I will just, when we have maybe some complex uh, property, so an object that contains a property of type object, so again we can take a sub-property of the object itself. And uh, we need to check whether the value, the variable is defined and if the property is defined, then the access to the, the, the sub property and so on. And we can do that with a chain of ifs or with a sort of a guarded expression with the end operator. So if this is true, then go forward, and this is true, truthy, so not falsely, then go forward. And this is the last one, so return this value. I'm returning this value if both of them are not undefined, falsely. I'm returning undefined if either of them, the first two, is undefined. Or even the third one, by the way. Okay, so we, you find a lot of this code uh, to protect access to properties that may be there or may not be there. Or another trick uh, is uh, to define a default value. So, uh, country, of uh, real country, let's say. I want to take the, imagine that you don't know whether a country is defined or not, okay? So you could say, if the country is defined, use the value that is in the object. Otherwise, use a default value. You can do that as a, with an if, and nothing gets killed. Or you can do that with a shortcut, like, uh, Okay, uh, if I take the real country from the profile or from my country is the world. I don't know. So what is happening here? Is this property country maybe defined or undefined? This is a or statement, a or expression. So if the country is defined, it's truthy. So the or evaluation stops here because it already knows that the result is true. And it returns the first element. So what you're writing here is if my profile country is not faulty, is not undefined, or zero or empty string, okay, that those hurt, but um, it's not undefined. So it's, if we have a string, then the result of the or expression is the string itself. And so we store it. 
if the count is undefined or the string of zero or null, we have five falsy values. Let's not forget about that. But if it's undefined, then the orp operator must continue because false or something means something. I must evaluate the something, and the something in this case is a string, which is whatever it is, it will always the, be the return value of this or operator. If it's false, the return will be false. If it's a string, the result will be a string. So we are saying that if this is undefined, count is undefined, then the real count will be the word. Okay. I think too that these people are crazy, but uh, uh, there are quite frequent idioms just because we are using objects so much that it, you're in a function, uh, you don't, we don't you, instead of checking the parameters and do a lot of ifs, uh, you just compute the value that will do for you by applying a value or by applying by preventing some operation or better. And by the way, the nice or bad, depending on how you look at that, uh, of this. Uh, is that of these constructs of these patterns is that they are expressions and the door are expression they are not uh, statements like if and so you can put them into something that requires an expression imagine to a literal string i coming from this and so you're applying the default just inside the form the string that you're formatting you're saving five statements and also creating a couple of bugs, probably. That's because of the zero and the empty string that makes this a bit fragile. But anyway, if you know what, where your objects are coming from, they are very uh, frequently used uh, methods. Um, there is a, a, a way, I won't spend much time because it's not very useful, of iterating over the properties of an object. So, uh, for example, for in, for in, the for in construct uh, iterates uh, once per every object. In this case, uh, the, the variable, the loop variable, will be a string representing the different, uh, uh, the different names of the properties that we find in the object without any particular ordering. So you can find the properties being shuffled or there is no order maintaining the properties, there is no source order. Sort of, no. mm, I say it's not very frequent because uh, uh, if I have an object whose properties represent different information, it's quite unlikely, unlikely that we want to do something, the same operation on all of them yet with a for loop. Okay. So it's quite it's more used in inside libraries that needs to deal with unknown objects, so they need to do something with the property, but uh, Mm. The, the main purpose of the for in is to for me to make mistakes instead of for of uh, and so I hate it I can also query an object uh, by asking uh, what are your keys and so it will give me an array of strings uh, that represent the keys this is useful uh, or uh, what are your entries and the, it will create it will flatten out the object uh, is an array of arrays uh, where the first uh, element of each subarray is the name of the property and the second is the value of the property and so on so if you want to iterate uh, uh, over the keys or over the entries uh, you can just get this uh, the method these are methods of a of object with the capital o which is a predefined object in the standard library and its argument is your own object so it's not a method of objects, uh, but it's a, in Java, we would call it, we would call it a static method. Hmm? There's no notion here. It's just a property of a predefined object. But we use it in the same way. OK, copying objects has the same behavior as copying uh, um, arrays. The equal statement is supported, but it's just copying the reference. So I have an object, 
book defined here with two properties. Book two equal to book just creates a new variable with a reference to the same old object. So the two are two aliases and they refer to the same value. If I want to copy an object, so to create a copy with a this distinct from the first one so that it can modif be modified independently from the first one, we need, uh, well, there are three or four different methods. The one uh, by the book is uh, using object with assign. Assign is a strange function. What it does is take an object, creates a copy of this object, and this case is an empty one. And adds to this copy the properties stolen from the other, the second parameter. So if we, it's used, uh, for example, for merging two objects. I create an object with some properties. I make a copy of that and add a new property to those. Uh, if the first object is an empty object with no properties, uh, then the net effect, the net result uh, is that the, I'm creating a copy with the same identical properties of the second parameter, which can be written, but there's also a, a shortcut, which is implemented here, with the spread operator, the three dots. So the same spread operator that we already applied to arrays, to flatten an out, uh, uh, flatten the element out, uh, is also applied to uh, objects. And so, one, the easiest way of creating a copy of an object, uh, const your profile, equal to a copy of mine, my profile. Three dots, my profile. And so, it's just expanding the, all the pairs, uh, key value pairs uh, of my profile, they're expanding them inside these braces, and so we are constructing a new object. It's the same as doing object at the sign, but I think it's more readable and more. It's something that uh, it's more recent. Uh, it says here that uh, only since 2018. So ES9, or normally what we are discussing, it was ES2015. And this was introduced later on, and it's very useful. By the way, it's more general because uh, you can mix uh, some properties with some spreading of other objects. So you can create a new object from an old one by adding new, uh, uh, new properties also. And uh, so in this case, uh, we had book uh, with two properties, also on pages. We are creating book two with the same property as book uh, and uh, a title. So we will have three properties at this point. This one. This will be the result of the second book or the third, and in this case, we are making a copy of the, of the second. Or of the third. This can be used to create a, an extended version of an object with more properties, or also to selectively replace some properties. I want to create a new object. For example, your profile I, my profile, in my profile, uh, let's uh, remember my profile is this one, country Italy. I want to create a copy where the country is not Italy, but it's different. So I can create a copy, I, if I call it my, your profile, okay, console.log your profile. Okay, it, it will be identical. Okay. The, my profile and your profile, the last two lines, for the moment, they are identical because I just copied the same properties. They are identical, they are not the same object because it's not a reference, it's a copy. Okay. While creating that, I could uh, add some properties. So, for example, I could add that uh, in your profile, uh, uh, so, so intelligence is top, the QI is 100. Not my, but yours, so column. And so I'm adding a new property, and this is easy. Okay, and the dot. But I can also modify some property. 
So if, if instead of adding new, we redefine, we will take country, maybe the, I don't know, XX. I don't know, I don't want to disclose it. So strings in an object that cannot be two identical keys, if I'm defining a key, a key that is already there, it will override the previous one in order. If I put it before, which I could do, it will take the last one. It will take Italy. So this is nice because if I put it at the end, I'm overwriting an existing object because I'm taking the property of an object and then I modify something surgically. All the other property will be the same and that one will be modified or added if it wasn't there. If I put it at the beginning, I'm setting a default value because if the property is defined, it will be written when I'm getting the spread if it was there. If it wasn't there, this value remains and so it will work as a default. So the same operator can be used for different types of tricks. I'm creating an object. I can have an object with all the defaults. I can write something like, uh, I, know I create a new object with a default object. And then a real object. So I'm creating something with all different properties, and then I, I have a real object that is coming from my code that contains uh, some or all of those properties, and those take, will take precedence because they have priority because they come later. They will override the previous one. But if they are not there, then I'm sure that all the properties defined in default will be present in the overall object. So it can be just one property, or it can be just a spread of some or several properties. And the same can be so. Uh, let uh, x equal to okay, just to. And the other one, and the other way, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm rewriting an object with some new, new, new property. So I can have uh, let uh, uh, real object equal to real object and then update and this these are general operations that don't require us to know the properties of either object we know what you want to do we don't need to go property by property so if I add you know, a point object with x and y, and then I go, we want to go to 3D, and so add the property z to the object x, y, and z, the same code uh, for managing this object will still work. I don't need to replace and copy every, every element. Just imagine if you had a Java object, for example, the pain that you go through to, for making a clone operation copies and recreate element uh, properties one by one because you are constrained from the two those to the class definition here it just takes what is there and copies them and over overrides them hmm? so the, the net result is that the code is very compact uh, and uh, it may become difficult to read if we are using a lot of these shortcuts and conventions at the same time Okay, so let's be careful, try to do small baby steps. Uh, okay, is there anything more to say about objects? Uh, well, the in operator. Okay, no, that's uh, more or less it. Uh, objects, so by themselves are, let okay. Um, a link, simple but powerful data structure. There are only, they only have one rule. I'm mapping a string to a value. 
and then all the rest is just syntax for for managing them very, very easily these property names can be constants identifiers can be strings can be computed and the real power comes when you are mixing objects with functions and uh, which are the real uh, complex uh, stuff in uh, and powerful stuff in JavaScript. I think uh, if I had to summarize uh, JavaScript, I would say functions, okay, which is the real nature. Um, well, the fun a function in JavaScript behaves like a function in every language you know. It has a name take some parameters, it will have a body of uh, code to execute when called, uh, and returns a value. That is for sure, okay? So we don't have to forget anything from, that we know from other languages. Functions, but, but functions are also objects, are also values. And they can be used uh, in expressions, they can be used uh, uh, as values anywhere. Hmm? And so this, mm, mm, no, simplifies a lot, a lot of other programming patterns. Okay, function declaration can be done in uh, three, at least three ways. There are different syntaxes. First is the classical one. Function, function name, parameters. Okay, so we may define a function, uh, for example, no, we had uh, uh, in our example about the acronyms. We have this code for converting a word into its initials, which is ugly, ugly code, so we want to put it into a function. Okay, let's, so let's def define a function. Extract uh, acronym from a word, from a words, a list of words. And then do some code inside. Okay, so we are defining a new function with this name. We are defining an object of type function and name extract acronym that in this case takes one parameter. There are no type definitions, of course. We don't know what is the type of words. It may be anything, maybe a string, maybe a, so we must document it because you cannot constrain it. Um, and we don't know whether the function returns a value and of what type the value could be. We defined a variable of type function, and this variable is a uh, variable definition, it's a function definition, but it's also a variable definition, is hoisted. Remember we were talking about hoisting, about vari var variable means that it's written in line 36, uh, but then it's, uh, it's accessible from all the calls. So if I'm calling, if I want to call function extract acronym from this code here, the name is already defined. Because function definitions are, in, in the jargon said, function definitions are hoisted. Hmm? Function, name, parameters. If I have more than one parameters, I will say, uh, I will add them, and just the names, not the values, not the types, sorry, in JavaScript. And this is a classical function definition. Okay, there's nothing to learn about that. You can do something, you can return a value with the return instruction, return statement. If you don't return anything, the function itself will return undefined. So a value is always returned. It can be my return value or it can be undefined, hmm? uh, which is a, a normal value. Hmm? The parameters are passed by reference. You can get, so I have a reference to the, to the value that is coming from the color program. So for right now, in the main program is an object of type number of value four. The reference to the object is passed uh, as a parameter value which is when I create the parameter, it will be initialized with the same reference as the formal as the, as the actual parameter in the caller program. It's just normal pass by reference like, like Java, like Python, whatever. 
we don't make any difference between uh, primitive types or composite types or object types it's always by reference what it happens is that the primitive types uh, are often immutable so numbers and strings are immutable so you can think also of passing by value of primitive types just because you cannot modify them so having a reference or, or having a value <laughs> is uh, can is indistinguishable but the, the general mechanism is passing a reference so the, the function can modify the parameter and can return anything I return here a number I could return an object I could return an array what I want okay it's just because I'm returning a reference to whatever value I built and constructed during the function body execution um, okay let's let's go back to to these details about the parameter later on and then there are there's a second way of defining a function second and third way there are variants of the same which are function expressions the first one is a function declaration statement it's a statement by itself the other we are using still the keyword function but as an expression so an expression that starts here and ends at the closing brace and the value of this expression will be an object of type function and so this object uh, must be stored somewhere so I'm storing the result of an expression into a variable cons fn equal to 7 okay it's not 7 it's a function it's not a string it's a function and uh, at the end, fn and uh, do in the first picture are equivalent. They are both variables that refer to a function, to an object of type function. Hmm. Seems a bit strange, but it's not. A function can be returned by an expression. Like when we open a, a square bracket, we are creating an object of type array when we open a curly brace we are creating an object of type object when we are writing function we are creating an object of type function and an object of type function has two elements in its definition the list of parameters and the body delimited by curly braces that function is created somewhere it's stored there and it just stays there until somebody wants to call it hmm? so I could also uh, in our uh, example here I could uh, write uh, uh, I don't know something return 3 plus 5 I don't know something and in my program I could see what happens After I define the function, you look at this console log, it prints, it printed the code of the function. So when you define a function, actually you are storing the representation of the code of that function in an object, special object of type function, and remember the reference to that, the variable that points to that. Can you, you can do that, uh, you can uh, define it uh, in a const uh, um, extract two words, sorry, equal function words and then uh, return uh, six plus six. And uh, it behaves in the same way. Function with some parameter with some body. Executable body. Of course, at that point, none of this instruction has already been executed. They've just been parsed and stored away. For executing them, you, you, you must call the function. Okay. You must call the fun call your function, mean having an object of type function and applying the 
function call operator, the apply operation, the round parentheses, onto that variable. Okay. You can call with the, by providing the list of parameters, the, the round brackets, uh, any object of type function. Uh, the second variant, so an expression that returns a function, can be an anonymous function or a named function. This name, in the second version, is not the name. Is not a name for uh, that we can use to call the function. It's just an internal property of the of the of the function itself uh, that can be useful in debugging, for example. No? The debugger knows about that, about this function internal name. Otherwise, it would just be a function without any name. And so in debugging, you say that uh, you have an error in, in your function. OK, which one? Uh, because this the value doesn't know the name of the variable where we store the data. So actually, the classical function definition is, is just a shortcut for this expression where the name of the variable holding the function name is equal to the internal function. And they behave exactly in the same way as before. You yeah, define the syntax for defining them function square with a classical definition and function cube with an ex function expression. They are indistinguishable when you're using them, when you're calling them. They behave. And in the debug view, you see that both of them are just local variables, variables that point to a function definition object somewhere. Why do we have two syntaxes? Because we want, uh, in many cases, to create a, a function and use it, and pass a function to, a, to another function, for example, or store a function into an object. So we need an easy way of creating a function, maybe also dynamic. There's a fourth way, third or fourth, depends on how you count uh, the two on the right, which is a shortcut of the function expression, where the keyword function has been dropped, and uh, a narrow is inserted between the parameters and the body. So instead of writing function parameters, we write parameters arrow. It's not such a big deal. We are saving some keystrokes, and we call them arrow functions. Uh, they are very compact to write, uh, and they also have some, some shortcuts uh, in, in syntax. That they will see. Yeah, it's a common way when you just create uh, need, uh, a function once uh, to use them once uh, uh, to to define that in this way. I'm here. I'm storing the function into a top-level variable fun uh, function fn that will be visible across uh, the program. But nobody forces me to store the name here. You can just define the function and then pass it around. Uh, and we'll see how. Okay, so it's a bit strange at the beginning because there are all these different ways. The first three or two uh, are more visible because of this big function word in, uh, in your face that screams, uh, I'm a function. Okay, This arrow is uh, less visible, so it may take a bit to understand that these really are functions. Okay, let's go back with some details uh, about the parameters. So when I define a function, I define a list of possible parameters. The color of the function can pass, should pass uh, some values no, to those to corresponding to those parameters, but is not obliged to pass all of them. So uh, it may be I define a function with four parameters, and the user only sends me two values. That means that the, the other, the third and the fourth, will be initialized with undefined. 
now we know the rule. Where something is missing, it's undefined, which is a legal value that you can test, you can use, and you can then use it for setting default values and so on. So it's not an error to call a function with less uh, parameters than, it than it, they were declared. By the way, it's very difficult to know how many parameters I have declared because the definition of a function is not something statically written in the code, compiled down. A function can be just being created out of, out of the air. You never know many parameters. You have a variable of type function, and where, where does it come from? I just have this value. So I try to call it, I give you some parameters, and then the function will see whether it got the right thing. Hmm? So there are no checks between these ones with a dynamically defined function. Um, so if uh, you, you want to check whether you received, actually received a parameter or not, you can check with undefined or with the one of the shortcuts, uh, uh, for example, setting a default value with your operator like we saw before, before processing the parameters. So I have the parameters, I'm not sure that they have been passed, so I'm just uh, setting a default value for each of them, if, if it makes sense for me. Or maybe I throw an error because I, I really need that parameter, why not? Okay. I can check them by checking, by comparing with undefined, or I could, uh, Specify always already specify um, a default value when you define the function. So this b equal to one means that okay, if the user passes two parameters, they, those will be. If the user only passes one parameter, the second will be forced initialized to one. So it saves me from setting the default by hand. If I pass to the function more parameter than it needs, uh, the rest are just ignored, are not accessible from inside the function normally hmm? um, unless I want the function to receive a, an arbitrary number of arguments and so I'm using the rest operator which is the same as, as the three points we can use as a spread for spreading value or a rest operator to collect values so in this, if I call this function with one parameter we go to part one and part two and R will be undefined if I call it with two parameters, we go to part one and part two, and that will be undefined. If I call with seven parameters, then we go to the first one to part one, the second to part two, and the rest, uh, the, the, the remaining five will be stored into an array here with indexes from zero to four with the rest, with the rest, the remaining five parameters. Okay? I don't like this thing, but it is supported by, by the library. We want to, to pass more, more uh, and a variable number of parameters. Okay. Okay, this just uh, just uh, arrow functions have a special uh, uh, short. They it's, they it's already a short syntax. They have uh, still a uh, uh, shortcut on them. Uh, so, for example, if you have uh, Normally, you have the list of parameters with uh, in, uh, in parentheses, but if you only have, if you have zero parameters, of course, you have to a couple of braces. So this is the minimal format: braces arrow, no braces, sorry, parentheses arrow. If you have uh, one parameter only, you can drop the braces. So it sometimes becomes even more difficult to look to find because it's the arrow that makes. Uh, just not confuse it with a less or equal. It's equal and greater. So the arrow will create a function with only one parameter. And then we have a body of these functions that is a, a normal body. Inside here, you can have uh, 27 instructions with fors, ifs, uh, whys, uh, whatever you want. Okay, it's a normal body of the function, and then you may have some return statement. Um, a further uh, shortcut is uh, if you are defining a narrow function that in the body only has one statement. If in the body you only have one statement and this statement is a return statement, so what the function does is just compute an expression and return the value, you can drop everything and just write the expression. So there are no braces, there is no return statement, just the expression 
whose value will be computed and returned. So in this case, we have a, some languages call them lambda function. Function that takes one parameter and returns a value. In general, an error function can do, can do anything. But more frequently, we are using them when we want to compute expression out of values. And the idea is that we are not computing this value right now. We are storing in this variable for the code for computing this expression. And when we need it, we call fourth of seven. Four seven, we call a, a square seven times square seven. Um, okay. So the things uh, becomes really interesting when we try to nest uh, function definitions. Because why not? Okay. Of course, we need next week to sit down a, bit, a little with some exercises about this concept. But let's try to put all the ingredients together. Uh, so defi defining a function is just creating an object of type, of type function and assign it uh, to a variable. That's what we said. So why not uh, creating a variable or square of type function inside another function? Okay. Of course, this function the name of this function will be visible only inside the other one. So maybe it's a helper function here. Now it's defined with function. It could be defined with an arrow. Totally equivalent. Okay, this is easier on the eye, but this the second one is easier to recognize as you prefer. But in both cases, the function hypotenuse is using function square inside it. And we don't want to define function square at the top level, because maybe we don't need it anywhere else, we define it inside. Okay. Hmm? The trick it becomes complex when the inner function is a pure inner function. A pure function is a function that only depends on its parameters. This function receives x, and all the work it does depends only on x. Here. But what happens if the function accesses R, A, or B? Syntactically, the body of the function is inside the body of the external function. So syntactically, it could access some variables like parameters or local variables defined inside the enclosing function. So it's a function that may use some vari variables that are defined inside, not inside itself, that would be normal, but inside uh, the enclosing function. This is called a closure. And this is a key concept for programming JavaScript. A closure, this is a definition which is not very understandable, a name given to a feature in the language, okay, by which a nested function can access the outer function scope. I dropped the, the difficult part. So I have an inner function that can access a variable from the enclosing function. That's easy. That's easy as long as the inner function is called while the outer function is still active. Here, if uh, square was using maybe a and b for whatever reason, it's not a problem because we are executing function square here and here the variable a and b plus any other local variable is still valid okay uh, let's imagine let's make an example to see that uh, Let's define a function power, okay? Uh, 
x to the n I don't know okay or uh, sorry yeah um, hyper hypotenuse so I can calculate an hypotenuse uh, of uh, uh, something with uh, many dimensions so it will be x plus y and z maybe on, on the 3d space or whatever okay let's just imagine so we you need uh, to do some power so we have a, a function power of x that returns uh, x to the n for example Let, let's make a, just a multiplication x times n okay it doesn't it's not computing anything useful okay but Uh, by the way, power equal. Let's not call it x, call it uh, z, just to separate them. So, function power is an inner function defined with an error syntax that takes one parameter, z, and computes some expression. It's called here where the parameter value for z is taken from the parameter x of the function okay but the function inside is also using n which is not one of these parameters from the point of view of this function n is an external value but it can be accessed because it's within its scope if i maybe define an exponent uh, cons exponent equal to n uh, times 7 I could use also use here the exponent from inside the inner function I'm accessing some local variables parameters or locally defined variables in the enclosing function and this is also so all nice okay when I'm calling power x will be transferred to z and x will have, will have a value which is the value that it had here in line 8 because the function is still active the variable x still exists right the difficult part comes when we read that the nested function power is executed after the execution of the outer function is ended so what if I could uh, extract this function just a variable and call this function after the hyperhypotenuse function has ended This function takes a parameter, so I can call this function anywhere I want by giving it a parameter. But it's also using a value. And if I call in this function um, without, uh, outside of, this of the enclosing function, the x variable would have been disappeared. So we say, how, how can this be done? It's easy. I just return power here. And later on, I call hyper of uh, 3, 4. Sorry. Uh, P equal, and then I can call P 6. So, I'm defining this function, does some stuff stupid arithmetic stuff and returns a function a function that they define inside. So, so instead instead of creating an object instead of creating an array that I want to return I create a function and they return this function so whoever calls this hyper whatever the function here given these two parameters will receive back p which is will be a function okay p is a function 
and if p is a function with one parameter, I can call this function with one parameter. Why not? And when I call this function with one parameter, we execute this code actually with the value z from the parameter 6 that I gave. And the value of x? Because the variable x is no longer alive. It's been created during the call of hyperhypotenuse, and then it's been destroyed, destroyed at the end of the function. So how can the function? So this is where the closure comes into place. We say that uh, this function power has, uh, has um, owns a closure over variable x. It means uh, it contains internally in the definition of function power, there is a reference to that variable. So when the function hyperhypotenuse is destroyed, that, that variable survives. It survives because there is still some reference to it. And this reference is buried inside the definition of power. Yes? Uh, yeah, in this case, x is not used. We, we should not. What we want to do is not call in the function. Yes, in this case, x is not used here. Yeah, right. Because we want to return the function, that, and the x will be provided when we really call the function. Yes. Uh, a var, in, yes, the question was if I put var instead of const, uh, the hosting of the vars uh, will be only inside the same function. So we will not go outside the function. Okay, so the interesting things happen here. And then we'll see the consequences uh, next week. Function p is an object that contains a reference to a snapshot or the variable expert that was defined before. So it's a function that can contain a state from a disease function. And the value that will be stored into this expert is the value that was computed by the call of hyperhypotenuse at that time. OK? Uh, we need, uh, of course, to do some realistic example to see how it works, uh, and especially how it works in conjunction with objects. OK? And we'll do that uh, on next uh, Tuesday. <laughs>